and icy wind blew in violent gusts, but we marched without faltering. The SS made us increase our pace. Faster, you swine, you filthy sons of bitches. Why not? The movement warmed us up a little. The blood flowed more easily in our veins. One felt oneself reviving. Faster, you filthy sons of bitches. We were no longer marching. We were running like automatons. The SS were running too, their weapons in their hands. We looked as though we were fleeing before them. Pitch darkness, every now and then an explosion in the night. They had orders to fire on any who could not keep up. Their fingers on the triggers. They did not deprive themselves of this pleasure. If one of us stopped for a second, a sharp shot finished off another filthy son of a bitch. I was putting one foot in front of the other mechanically. I was dragging with me this skeletal body with which, which weighed so much. If only I could have got rid of it. In spite of my efforts not to think about it, I could feel myself as two entities, my body and me. I hated it. I repeated to myself, don't think, don't stop, run. Near me, men were collapsing in the dirty snow. Shots. At my side marched a young Polish lad called Zalman. He had been working in the electrical warehouse at Buna. They had laughed at him because he was always praying or meditating in some problem of the Talmud. It was his way of escaping from reality, of not feeling the blows. He was suddenly seized with cramp in the stomach. I've got stomach ache, he whispered to me. He could not go on. He had to stop for a moment. I begged him. Wait a mo wait a bit, Zelman. We shall all be stopping soon. We're not going to run like this till the end of the world. But as he began to undo his buttons, crying, I can't go on any longer. My stomach's bursting. Make an effort, Zelman. Try. I can't, he groaned. His trousers lowered. He let himself sink down. That is the last picture I have of him. I do not think it can have been the SS who finished him, because no one had noticed. He must have been trampled to death beneath the feet of the thousands of men who followed us. I quickly forgot him. I began to think of myself again. Because of my painful foot, a shudder went through me at each step. A few more yards, I thought. A few more yards, and that will be the end. I shall fall. A spurt of red flame. A shot. Death wrapped itself around me till I was st stifled. It stuck to me. I felt that I could not touch it. The idea of dying, of no longer being, began to fascinate me. Not to exist any longer. Not to feel the horrible pains in my foot. Not to feel anything, neither wariness, nor cold, nor anything. To break the ranks. To let oneself slide to the edge of the road. My father's presence was the only thing that stopped me. He was running at my side, out of breath, at the end of his strength, at wit's end. I had no right to let myself die. What would he do without me? I was his only support. These thoughts had taken up a brief space of time, during which I had gone on running without feeling my throbbing foot, without realizing that I was running, without being conscious that I, was, that I owned a body galloping there on the road in the midst of so many thousands of others. When I came to myself again, I tried to slacken the pace, but there was no way. A great tidal wave of men came rolling onward and would have crushed me like an ant. I was simply walking in my sleep. I managed to close my eyes and to run like that while asleep. Now and then, someone would push me violently from behind and I would wake up. The other would shout, Run faster! If you don't want to go on, let other people come past. All I had to do was to close my eyes for a second, to see a whole world passing by, to dream a whole lifetime. An endless road, letting oneself be pushed by the mob, letting oneself be dragged along by a blind destiny. When the SS became tired, they were changed. But no one changed us. Our limbs numb with cold despite the running, our throats parched, famished, breathless, on we went. We were masters of nature, masters of the world. We had forgotten everything, death, fatigue, our natural needs. Stronger than cold or hunger, stronger than the shots and the desire to die, condemned and wandering, mere numbers, we were the only men on earth. At last, the morning star appeared in the gray sky. A trail of indeterminate light showed on the horizon. We were exhausted. We were without strength, without illusions. 
the commandant announced that we had already covered 42 miles since we left. It was a long time since we had passed beyond the limits of fatigue. Our, le our legs were moving mechanically in spite of us, without us. We went through a deserted village, not a living soul, not the bark of a dog. Houses were gaping windows. A few slipped without the ranks to try and hide in some desert deserted building. Still, one hour's marching more, and at last came the order to rest. We sank down as one man in the snow. My father shook me. Not here. Get up. A little farther on. There's a shed over there. Come on. I had neither the will nor the strength to get up. Nevertheless, I obeyed. It was not a shed, but a brick factory with a caved-in roof, broken windows, walls filthy with soot. It was not easy to get in. Hundreds of prisoners were crowding at the door. We at last succeeded in getting inside. There, too, the snow was thick. I let myself sink down. It was only then that I felt, really felt my weariness. The snow was like a carpet, very gentle, very warm. I fell asleep. I do not know how long I slept, a few moments or an hour. When I woke up, a frozen hand was patting my cheeks. I forced myself to open my eyes. It was my father. How old he had grown since the nights before. His body was completely twisted, shriveled up into itself. His eyes were petrified, his lips withered, decayed. Everything about him bore witness to extreme exhaustion. His voice was damp with tears and snow. Don't let yourself be overcome by sleep, Eliza. It's dangerous to fall asleep in the snow. You might sleep for good. Come on, come on, get up. Get up? How could I? How could I get myself out of this fluffy bed? I could hear what my father said, but it seemed empty of meaning, as though he had told me to lift up the whole building in my arms. Come on, son, come on. I got up, gritting my teeth. Supporting me with his arm, he led me outside. It was far from easy. It was as difficult to get out as to get in. Under our feet were men crushed, trampled underfoot, dying. No one paid any attention. We were outside. The icy wind stung my face. I bit my lips continually to prevent them from freezing. Around me, everything was dancing a dance of death. It made my head reel. I was walking in a cemetery among stiffened corpses, logs of wood. Not a cry of distress, not a groan, nothing but a mass agony and silence. No one asked anyone else for help. You died because you had to die. There was no fuss. In every stiffened corpse I saw myself, and soon I should not even see them. I should be one of them, a matter of hours. Come on, father, let's go back to the shed. He did not answer. He was looking at the dead. Come on, father. It's better over there. We can lie down a bit, one after the other. I'll watch over you, and then you can watch over me. We won't let each other fall asleep. We'll look after each other. He agreed. Trampling over living bodies and corpses, we managed to re-enter the shed. Here we let ourselves sink down. Don't be afraid, son. Sleep. You can sleep. I'll look after my you myself. No, you first, father. Go to sleep. He refused. I lay down and tried to force myself to sleep, to doze a little, but in vain. God knows what I would not have given for a few moments of sleep, but deep down I felt that to sleep would mean to die, and something within me revolted against this death. All around me, death was moving in silently without violence. It would seize upon some sleeping being, enter into him, and consume him bit by bit. Next to me, there was someone trying to wake up his neighbor, his brother, perhaps, or a friend. In vain. Discouraged in the attempt, the man lay down in his turn next to the corpse and slept too. Who was there to wake him up? Stretching out an arm, I touched him. Wake up, you mustn't sleep here. He half opened his eyes. No advice. He said in a faint voice, I'm tired. Leave me alone. Leave me. My father, too, was gently dozing. I could not see his eyes. His cap had fallen over his face. Wake up, I whispered in his ear. He started up. He sat up and looked round him, bewildered, stupefied, a bereaved stare. 
He stared all round him in a circle as though he had suddenly decided to draw up an inventory of his universe, to find out exactly where he was, in what place and why. Then he smiled. I shall always remember that smile. From which world did it come? The snow continued to fall in thick flakes over the corpses. The door of the shed opened. An old man appeared, his mustache covered with frost, his lips blue with cold. It was Rabbi Elihu, the rabbi of a small Polish community. He was a very good man, well loved by everyone in the camp, even by the capos and the head of the blocks. Despite the trials and privations, his face still shone with his inner purity. He was the only rabbi who was always addressed as rabbi at Buna. He was like one of the old prophets, always in the midst of his people to comfort them. And strangely, his words of comfort never provoked rebellion. They really brought peace. He came into the shed and his eyes, brighter than ever, seemed to be looking for someone. Perhaps someone has seen my son somewhere? He had lost his son in the crowd. He had looked in vain among the dying. Then he had snatched, scratched up the snow to find his corpse, without result. For three years they had stuck together, always near each other, for suffering, for blows, for the ration of bread, for prayer. Three years from camp to camp, from selection to selection, and now, when the end seemed near, fate had separated them. Finding himself near me, Rabbi Elihu whispered, it happened on the road. We lost sight of one another during the journey. I had stayed a little to the rear of my col of the column. I hadn't any strength left for running, and my son didn't notice. That's all I know. Where has he disappeared? Where can I find him? Perhaps you've seen him somewhere? No, Rabbi Elihu. I haven't seen him. He left then as he had come, like a windswept shadow. He had already passed through the door when I suddenly remembered seeing his son running by my side. I had forgotten that, and I didn't tell Rabbi Elihu. Then I remembered something else. His son had seen him losing ground, limping, staggering back to the rear of the column. He had seen him, and he had continued to run on in front, letting the distance between them grow greater. A terrible thought loomed up in my mind. He had wanted to get rid of his father. He had felt that his father was growing weak. He had believed that the end was near and had sought this separation in order to get rid of the burden, to free himself from an encumbrance which could lessen his own chances of survival. I had done well to forget that, and I was glad that Rabbi Elihu should continue to look for his beloved son. And in spite of myself, a prayer rose in my heart to that God in whom I no longer believed. My God, Lord of the universe, give me strength never to do what Rabbi Elihu's son has done. Shouts rose outside in the yard, where darkness had fallen. The SS ordered the ranks to form up. The march had began again. The dead stayed in the yard under the snow like faithful guards assassinated, without burial. No one had said the prayer for the dead over them. Sons abandoned their father's remains without a tear. On the way it snowed, snowed, snowed endlessly. We were marching more slowly. The guards themselves seemed tired. My wounded foot no longer hurt me. It must have been completely frozen. The foot was lost to me. It had detached itself from my body like the wheel of a car. Too bad I should have to resign myself. I could live with only one leg. The main thing was not to think about it. Above all, not at this moment. Leave thoughts for later. Our march had lost all semblance of discipline. We went as we wanted as we could. We heard no more shots. Our guards must have been tired, but death scarcely needed any help from them. The cold was consciously doing its work. At every step, someone fell and suffered no more. From time to time, SS officers on motorcycles would go down the length of the column to try and shake us out of our growing apathy. Keep going. We are getting there. Courage. Only a few more hours. We're getting gluets. These words of encouragement, even though they came from the mouths of our assassins, did us a great deal of good. No one wanted to give up now just before the end, so near to the goal. Our eyes searched the horizon for the barbed wire of gluets. Our only desire was to reach it as quickly as possible. 
The night had now set in. The snow had ceased to fall. We walked for several, several more hours before arriving. We did not notice the camp until we were just in front of the gate. Some capos rapidly installed us in the barracks. We pushed and jostled one another as if this were the supreme refuge, the gateway to life. We walked over pain-racked bodies. We trod on wounded faces, no cries, a few groans. My father and I were ourselves thrown to the ground by this rolling tide. Beneath our feet, someone let out a rattling cry. You're crushing me, mercy! A voice that was not unknown to me. You're crushing me, mercy, mercy! The same faint voice, the same rattle heard somewhere before. That voice had spoken to me one day. Where? When? Years ago? No, it could have only been at the camp. Mercy! I felt that I was crushing him. I was stopping his breath. I wanted to get up. I struggled to disengage myself so that he could breathe, but I was crushed myself beneath the weight of other bodies. I could hardly breathe. I dug my nails into the unknown faces. I was biting all around me in order to get air. No one cried out. Suddenly, I remembered Juliak, the boy from Warsaw who played the violin in the band at Buna. Juliak, is it you? Eliza, the 25 strokes of the whip. Yes, I remember. He was silent. A long moment elapsed. Juliak, can you hear me, Juliak? Yes, he said in a feeble voice. What do you want? He was not dead. How do you feel, Juliak? I asked. Less to know the answer than to hear that he could speak that he was alive. All right, Eliza. I'm getting on all right. Hardly in the air. Worn out. My feet are swollen. It's good to rest, but my violin. I thought he had gone out of his mind. What use was the violin here? What? Your violin? He gasped. I'm afraid. I'm afraid that they'll break my violin. I've brought it with me. I could not answer him. Someone was lying full length on top of me, covering my face. I was unable to breathe through either my mouth or nose. Sweat beaded my brow, ran down my spine. This was the end, the end of the road. A silent death, suffocation. No way of crying out, of calling for help. I tried to get rid of my invisible assassin. My whole will to live was centered in my nails. I scratched. I battled for a mouthful of air. I tore at decaying flesh, which did not respond. I could not free myself from this mass weighing down my chest. Was it a dead man I was struggling against? Who knows? I shall never know. All I can say is that I won. I succeeded in digging a hole through this wall of dying people, a little hole through which I could drink in a small quantity of air. Father, how are you? I asked as soon as I could utter a word. I knew he could not be far from me. Well, answered a distant voice which seemed to come from another world. I tried to sleep. He tried to sleep. Was he right or wrong? Can one sleep here? Was it not dangerous to allow your vigilance to fail even for a moment when at any minute death could pounce upon you? I was thinking of this when I heard the sound of a violin. The sound of a violin in this dark shed where the dead were heaped on the living. What madman could be playing the violin here at the brink of his own grave? Or was it really an hallucination? It must have been Juliac. He played a fragment from Beethoven's concerto. I had never heard sounds so pure in such a silence. How he, had he managed to free himself, to draw his body from under mine without my being aware of it? It was pitch dark. I could hear only the violin, and it was as though Juliac's soul were the bow. He was playing his life. The whole of his life was gliding on the strings, his lost hopes, his charred past, his extinguished future. He played as he would never play again. I shall never forget Juliac. How could I forget that concert given to an audience of dying and dead men? To this day, whenever I hear Beethoven played, my eyes close, and out of the dark rises this sad, pale face of my Polish friend, as he said farewell on his violin to an audience of dying men. I do not know for how long he played. I was overcome by sleep. When I awoke in the daylight, I could see Juliac opposite me, slumped over, dead. Near him lay his violin, smashed, trampled. A strange, overwhelming little corpse.
We stayed at Glowitz for three days, three days without food or drink. We were not allowed to leave the barracks. SS men guarded the door. I was hungry and thirsty. I must have been very dirty and exhausted, to judge from the appearance of the others. The bread we had brought from Buna had long since been devoured, and who knew when we would be given another ration? The front was following us. We could hear our new gunshots again very close, but we had neither the strength nor the courage to believe that the Nazis would not have time to evacuate us and that the Russians would soon be here. We heard that we were going to be deported into the center of Germany. On the third day at dawn, we were driven out of the barracks. We all threw blankets over our shoulders like prayer shawls. We were directed toward a gate which divided the camp into two. A group of SS officers were standing there. A rumor ran through our ranks, a selection. The SS officers did the selecting, the weak to the left, those who could walk well to the right. My father was sent to the, to the left. I ran after him. An SS officer shouted at my back, Come back here! I slipped in among the others. Several SS rushed to bring me back, creating such confusion that many of the people from the left were able to come back to the right, and among them, my father and myself. However, there were some shots and some dead. We were all made to leave the camp. After half an hour's marching, we arrived right in the middle of a field divided by rails. We had to wait for the train to arrive. The snow fell thickly. We were forbidden to sit down or even to move. The snow began to form a thick layer over our blankets. They brought us bread, the usual ration. We threw ourselves upon it. Someone had the idea of appeasing his thirst by eating the snow. Soon the others were imitating him. As we were not allowed to bend down, everyone took out his spoon and ate the accumulated snow off his neighbor's back, a mouthful of bread and a spoonful of snow. The SS who were watching laughed at this spectacle. Hours went by. Our eyes grew weary of scouring the horizon for the liberating train. It did not arrive until much later in the evening. In an infinity-long train, composed of cattle wagons with no roofs, the SS push pushed us in, a hundred to a carriage. We were so thin. Our embarkation completed. The convoy set out.